So hello, um, I'm joined today by Dr. Florian Schaub and Dr. Paula Vincent Ruse. Um, I'm gonna let them both introduce themselves in just a moment, uh, but really quickly, Dr. Schaub is an assistant professor of information at UM School of Information and Electrical Engineering and Computer Science at UM's College of Engineering. Uh, his research largely focuses on human computer interaction and data privacy and security. Uh, Dr. Paulette Vincent Ruse is a postdoctoral fellow at UM's College of Literature, Science, and the Arts, or LSMA, who uses quantitative methods in researching factors that impact marginalized students in pursuing STEM careers. Um, I'd like to start by asking you each to tell the audience a little bit more about yourselves, uh, your roles at the universities, as well as how those roles may have shifted um, now that we are in this COVID uh, pandemic. Um, Florian, uh, if we could start with you. Sure, thanks Ricky. Uh, yeah, it's great that we get, you know, we're able to get together in this fashion after all. Um, so I'm, as, as you said, I'm an assistant professor in the School of Information. My research focuses largely on um, understanding people's decision making when it comes to privacy and security questions in the context of technologies that includes websites, social media, uh, mobile apps, but also emerging technologies. We've done a lot of work on smart speakers and um, we're really interested in understanding why do people make decisions that are maybe uh, detrimental to their privacy or security and um, developing solutions that help them better manage their privacy, better manage their security, security more consistently adhere to security advice, and um, then testing these often through um, user studies and human subjects research, which in terms of shifting priorities, that has been one of the, uh, one of the main areas where we had to adapt um, over the last couple of weeks and months is to really think about how can we move a lot of our research that uh, sometimes is online already, sometimes is lab-based, um, how can we move that online while still answering research questions that are meaningful and are not um, and, and not skewing our populations and other aspects by moving online? And then the, the other big shift is, of course, teaching online. Right. So how do we? We had to switch very quickly from residential instruction to teaching um, online. For me, that meant switching to project-oriented courses to be online only. Um, I think we did that worked out relatively well, but, but it's really challenging to kind of straddle the, um, on the one hand, maintaining excellence of education and, and making sure we're, we're not letting down our standards while at the same time providing flexibility for people and um, making sure that, that everyone can participate in um, our lectures and in instruction. Thank you, and uh, Paulette, how about you? Hey, I'm really excited to be here. Thanks for inviting me. Um, I was originally brought in as a postdoc to work on eCoach project, which is an online platform created by uh, academic innovation to support students in large enrollment classrooms. Some professors that want to provide more support for students in large enrollment classrooms, given that they cannot meet one-on-one -on -one with them when you have 300 people, that will take all your time. Uh, and I'm also involved with the Seismic Project, which is a multi-institutional project that also tries to think about how to support students in large enrollment classrooms. Uh, but this hit and our world's gone like upside down, right? And now um, I think my research has shifted from uh, thinking about these topics really broadly and a little bit about like, okay, what can we design so in a couple of years we can intervene and sort of fix things to like, what can we do in this instant? Uh, to sort of like support uh, the students that are right now in a really, really difficult situation. And also professors that had no training whatsoever in education to begin with, right? And now they're like being pushed to try to like do something totally different online. Uh, so my research now is focusing on actually trying to figure out how our students uh, taking this change from a bubble that is a university that is providing them food in a cafeteria and they have a house to stay in the dorms. And if they may not have a great computer, they can go to the library to use the computers that the library uh, is offering them, right? They have a bunch of resources at their fingertips, right? So there's many inequities in the experience in college at U of M or any university, but still by, the, by paying your tuition, right? And by living in campus, you have sort of like these things at your fingertips. 
And as soon as COVID hit and everybody had to retreat to your places, to their own homes, now they don't have that anymore. So some students may be food insecure, some students may not have access to internet, right? Some students may not have access to textbooks so easily. And then what do you do then now to support students in a way that is equitable, but that at the same time, right, like uh, professors don't lose their heads trying to like solve a thousand problems at the same time. And as we move forward to the new semester, right, who's not coming back, who had such a really horrible experience with classes that they want to switch from majors from STEM to something different because they think this is not good for them, who because they have such financial strain, they cannot come back, right? So students are now currently making a lot of decisions that like were unexpected. And, and I think we're having this conversation a lot in the sense of like, universities are gonna be financially impacted. I'm like, this sucks. And I'm like, yeah, can we just move to the humans back a little bit and think about the students that are like totally scared and they don't know how to make a decision like this, right? Uh, so yeah, that is what I'm currently doing. And then uh, sticking with you, Paulette, for a moment, uh, what thoughts do you have from this experience um, in uh, transitioning to distance education and what best practices do you have for instructional faculty who may be navigating this still and struggling with the transition? Well, I think I, I, I know we're using online and distance and, and remote like sort of interchangeably a little bit, right? But like they're really different things, right? When we're talking about online education, you're talking about a system that has a platform, it has a plan, it was designed to be taught online, right? Like if, if you're using a MOOC, right? That was, that was designed to be done online at a size, they have the platform, they have the resources, right? People that enroll in this online type of universities or courses, right? They know what they're signing up to when they're doing it. They know what it means to do it online. We're doing this sort of like emergency remote teaching just because we have no other option, right? And, and it's not as well planned, it was not designed, right? Like professors, I think are struggling first to understand that translation and, 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 you know, I've never been a fan of lecturing in front of a class. That is not, in my opinion, the best way to teach, but that is definitely not something that you can translate online so easily anyway. Right. So like we're talking about, I think first we need to just stop, right. And breathe and just accept the messiness of the situation. Toddlers are going to run behind you. Cats are going to jump. Dogs are going to rough like you know connections are like gonna disappear and i think we're we need to accept the messiness of the thing first that this is not gonna be perfect and you're probably gonna be really bad at this at the beginning because this is not something you were supposed to be doing to begin with uh there's a reason we're professors and not tv personalities right uh and now once you do that right i think the best practice is to first start by centering your more marginalized students and whatever you do to support them, everybody will be fine, right? Like a student that has resources is not gonna be affected by you making a decision to support a marginalized student. But if you make decisions on how to teach your course without thinking about them first, then you're gonna be leaving them behind from the design and the onset of what you're doing. So that will be like tip number one, center equity first. Thank you so much for that. Um, and Florian, do you have anything to add about instructional practices? Anything that you've encountered for um, your time in distance ed? Uh, yeah, for, first, I, I have to second that point, right? Like just accept the messiness. And um, my toddlers definitely made uh, guest appearances in my lecture. Um, I, I think one thing that, that is really difficult at the moment for instructors is to start to think about the fall because we don't really know yet um, what the mode of uh, teaching and instruction will be in the fall. And it might actually might change throughout the term, depending on how this pandemic evolves. And I think dealing with that uncertainty and at the same time preparing for multiple eventualities is, uh, is challenging. But I think as Paulette said, kind of focus, on, um, focus on, on what you want to communicate. What are your learning goals? And put those uh, front and center and try to design around that. And um, then doing it in a way that you can teach online or remotely in that way. And if we're lucky that we can teach uh, residentially, you know, hopefully whatever you did to make your, your course work distributely also brings an advantage to the physical classroom with it. Um, I think that would be, be one, one aspect, yeah. And then uh, sticking with you again. Um, so 
so many of us are working at home at this point, uh, obviously at the University of Michigan with the campus closure and um, pretty much everywhere else. Um, for researchers in particular, uh, you could be handling sensitive data. Uh, there could be new vulnerabilities that exist in the at-home working environment that don't exist, at, at least to as great a degree um, when you're working on campus. Um, could you quickly explain um, and describe maybe some of the major vulnerabilities we should be looking out for as well as any uh, best practices for mitigating them? Yeah, so I think first there's um, the fact that there's some research that can't just move online. Um, and, and then if, if you're in the lucky position that you might be able to adjust your research or your research agenda to move some of your research activities online, to have contingencies when it comes to uh, conducting your research, um, I think it's important to keep in mind security concerns in particular, as well as if, when you're working with human subjects, um, privacy and confidentiality of your subjects. Right? And that, that includes thinking about what technologies are you using for conducting, conducting the research. We're using Zoom right now. The reason that I'm comfortable with using Zoom is that the University of Michigan actually has a very strong agreement with Zoom. Right? This is a different version of Zoom than um, when, you, when you sign up for a free account with your, with your personal email address. And, and um, if you're conducting medical research, there's actually a separate Zoom instance run by the university, well, not run by the University of Michigan, but offered by the University of Michigan for HIPAA compliant research. Um, so really making sure you're using the right tools for the right research. And um, I would suggest talking with the IT department, ITS here at Michigan, um, to make sure that, that whatever you, what, you, what you're doing, you're not overlooking something. Right. Like I think, um, I don't want to say every researcher needs to become an expert in security and privacy. I study this for a living, right? That's what I do and like to do, but I know a lot of people don't want to spend their time with this. So one way of kind of short circuiting that or shortcutting there a little bit is um, to pay attention to what tools are already being supported by the university and focusing on those. ITS has a great tool. It's called the Sensitive Data Guide. Um, you can find it at safecomputing.umich.edu slash data guide. And it actually tells you for different classes of data uh, what tools you can use with it. And for example, um, the Google Drive instance at Michigan is something you can use for human subjects data. You can store um, interview transcripts or recordings in, in Google Drive if you want to. Um, and that's something that's good to know, right? But, but I think you also need to know when you think a platform would be a nice tool for it, but it's actually not supported. So um, the university at this point doesn't have an agreement with Slack, for example. Slack is a very popular collaboration platform. Right? So maybe that's not the best tool to use for, for research with human subjects. And it's maybe also not the best tool to necessarily use in your classrooms um, because the, there's no guarantees by the university that the data will be protected. So I think looking at that is useful. And then um, I think also just generally being a little bit cautious. Um, scams are on the rise, phishing attacks are on the rise. Um, don't click on that email that wants to sell you surgical masks and N95 masks, it's probably not real. Um, think about the security of your home network. Um, and what's the last time you changed your Wi-Fi password? How old is your router? Has your router been updated in the last month or years? Um, might make sense. If you end up conducting interviews from home, right, like through video conferencing, you might want to consider unplugging your smart speaker um, so that uh, you know whatever is said actually stays between the researcher and the, um, the participant and doesn't accidentally get recorded by Amazon or another com company. So I think kind of like thinking about security and privacy holistically and then creating an environment for you that you feel comfortable with or seeking help to to do that is, is a good step forward um, rather than doing it ad hoc and for each situation. Thank you. Yeah, I actually, I have unplugged my smart speaker um, just for this interview as well. Can't claim to have done everything else on that list, but that's very helpful. Um, Paula, do you have anything to add uh, to that conversation? Yeah, I think, I mean, that's a great point. Uh, I don't have a smart speaker, so then we're fine in that regard. Uh, but I do think uh, there's a couple of things that have been happening, right? I think uh, a lot of 
apps are trying to like get some clients through this crisis and they're offering like, if you use this app, your teaching will be better or you can use it for this. And like, uh, it sounds really tempting, right? To use it because it seems really easy. And like, uh, that there is really like, it's not really sure what's using with the data. And now you need to think also like, you're also involving students data with this, right? It's like, my, it's one of my favorite examples that doesn't necessarily apply to COVID, but like I think, uh, not that it doesn't apply to COVID, but like it happened before COVID. It's like when like you see on Twitter that people post homeworks of their students or exams of their students and they're like complaining about them um, making a silly answer. And every time I see that, I just go in the answer and says like, hey, you, you're like actually breaking federal law by doing this because you're like breaking students' privacy, right? So think a little bit about that if what you're making them use is like posting a picture of their homework on the internet, because that is basically what's happening. It's tricky because the students that we're teaching now are living in a world where they're just putting their data out there, right? Like if you ask them to use Discord for your class, is they already had an account in Discord and it feels really weird to try to think about privacy when they're really putting everything about themselves in Instagram and Twitter and Facebook and then Discord and like, like they have all these things. Um, but at the end of the day, uh, I think you need to think about the things that like you may inadvertently showing. So if you're recording your class, don't record your students with it, right? Like they, you have no right of showing the backgrounds of your students' homes when you're posting somebody online. So, so try to be like, I think, I don't know a lot about privacy in terms of like the, the agreements that you always click, have to accept in order to move forward with the app. But like, I think just think about it. If what is what I'm doing, like posting a picture of the homework on Twitter or Instagram. And I think most of the times we can tell if that is what the app is doing or not. And if the answer is yes, it's like that, then just don't use it, right? Don't fall for the free trial or uh, we're letting you use it because COVID is allowing us, like we're letting you and we're really nice with our hearts. Right, like we need to remember that the business today is data and the way all these companies are becoming millionaires is by selling our data and data mining. So it's not like they can read your name and know who you are, but, at this, but you're still giving them, giving everything away to them. And um, so you need to be really careful and think a little bit about it. So stick only with the things the university is telling you to use. I know it's sometimes like, oh, I need to use Canvas. Or only this plugin of Canvas that I accept that what if I wanna use this one? But the ones that are already approved have already been approved for a reason and it's because of the security purposes, right? Not necessarily because they're flashy or pretty or the easiest to use, but like they're keeping the security at least tight. Yeah, and I think at least something that I find here at Michigan is that um, ITS is very much in the business of enabling things and trying to work with instructors and researchers to make things work. So um, whenever you feel like whatever, there's something you want to do that doesn't work with currently existing tools, right? Go talk to them and say what you want to accomplish. And they might either say like, well, here's this other thing that pretty much does what you want and, and is actually also protecting student privacy um, and is secure. Um, or they might say like, oh, that's really interesting. Let's see if we can work something out. Um, and that's, for example, how Michigan ended up um, offering Zoom uh, just a couple of days after moving online because there was a like, uh, demand from from faculty and instructors saying like okay we really want to use this this tool and then uh, ITS sat down to um, very quickly negotiate a really good agreement with Zoom for the university. I think the other thing to also consider is when choosing tools for teaching in particular is that you might be thinking you're you're super creative and you're coming up with like these cool solutions to to new problems right but also think of it from a student perspective students are taking not just your class they're taking many different classes at the same time um and it's probably very confusing and annoying if you have to use 20 different tools for four classes at the same time right so i think i'm um, thinking a little bit what what are the opportunity costs for the students what's the learning curve um, might also be useful and sometimes simple tools can work really well. So one thing I used in my class is to um, allow students to ask questions during presentations. We just had a Google Doc. People just type the questions in the Google Doc and that works remarkably well. It's something everyone can edit at the same time and, and, and it helps you like retain some engagement and it's easy to learn rather than some tools that might be more difficult. Doesn't mean all new learning tools are bad or not worth a try i'm just saying um sometimes it doesn't maybe need a fancy technology solution but rather 
fancy pedagogical approach to make things work. Yeah, and I, if I can add to that, I this what you just said is really important. Pedagogy and technology are not necessarily the same thing. I think we think just because we're putting technology to things, we're being pedagogical, right? And so when people are like, oh, do you do technology-based research? And I was like, well, what do you mean by that? You mean giving somebody an iPad to look at the screen? Like, what, what are we talking about when we say these words? And I think, I know, I know it's spring in some sense. I, I feel like some people are feel freed from the, like, the boundaries of the classroom when they got into the situation. And I think they wanted to let their creativity go because it was a way to cope with the situation. But yeah, like, do experiment on your students, right? Like, this is not the moment to just see if this crazy idea, oh, I don't want to say crazy because that's ableist. So like, it's, it's not the moment to say this wild idea is going to work, right? Because you're experimenting with your students when you're doing that, right? Like, you don't even know if it's going to work just because it sounds cool doesn't mean it's going to work. If you're not somebody that knows about education research, then probably it's not going to work. It's not because I don't think you're smart. It's because you don't have the training to do this. Right, and the consequences you're probably gonna affect your students in the meantime. So, like, I think it's a moment that we remember that, like, whatever we do, right, who is it gonna affect? And it's gonna be the students in your classroom. There's like a Google Doc. I, I love that idea. It's it's a great idea. They don't need to install another plugin. They don't need to have it on their phones. They can just do it. It doesn't take a lot of attention. Doesn't suck internet as much because if you're trying to do a video plus the other app, plus the other app, like all the internet is being like sucked by the computer. And what if you're like one in a house of five while your dad is doing a conference call and your mom is trying to work too and then all your brothers and sisters are, are in a class at the same time, right? Like we need to be mindful of the bandwidth issues, right? So I do think simple is better in this sense and like just stick with things that you know work or that somebody that has done research on this tells you it works. Right. And then after this, we can sit down and we can design and you, you can email me and we can sit down and design something and you want to change your classroom and like we can plan this carefully uh, and do something. Right. But interventions take time to be designed and be thoughtful about them, especially if you want to be equitable to your students. It's not something that you can just throw at the Internet uh, just to see if it works while you're trying to survive the pandemic. Thank you both for that. Um, so we're almost out of time here. I just want to leave you with, uh, if, if, you, if there's anything from the interview uh, we didn't get to that you wanted to bring up that's really important to the University of Michigan community um, or higher ed in general, um, just sharing any final thoughts as we close out. Uh, I think uh, I'm just gonna go back to the signing with the end of in mind. So center marginalized students, right? And really think of what you're doing is necessary. So like one of the biggest discussions right now is about labs, right? What are we going to do if the labs are not in person? Uh, and I think it needs to be questioned, what is the role of the lab? What am I trying to get out of this lab with my students? And if the answer is argumentation and thinking and analyzing data, right? You don't need to be physically in a lab for that right now. If that is safer, you can do case studies. Right, there's a national database of case studies. You just put that on Google and it will show it. It will work just like as a lab because you will get data that will need to analyze, it will need to answer questions. You can use your TAs to support students, right? The only thing that will be missing is that there won't be this like tactical component on it. But unless your lab, because it depends on the lab topic, unless your lab is truly about training a technique specifically that needs to be done by hand, right? There's alternatives to it. So Think about what you want to get out of this rather than like trying to cram the rea what was our past that we're never going back to it into the current present. Well, this emergency present and whatever falls looks like, right? And if you design fall expecting to be like we are right now in our house, right? And everybody looked down, even if we go back to campus, your life will be way easier than if you plan to just go back to the past that is not happening. And then suddenly in October, they tell you we're all going back to our houses and you need to start from scratch. Yeah, I think, I think those are great points. Uh, everything Paulette just said. Um, in, in, in addition to that, I, I would say when it comes to privacy and security, um, the goal is not that everyone becomes a privacy and security expert. Right? And I don't think that's necessary. I think it's um, 
thinking a little bit about potential privacy risks and implications, and also your legal obligation as an instructor to protect your students' privacy. And, and then um, if you have concerns or questions, seeking expert advice. And um, at Michigan, that would be ITS to go to and um, say, hey, we want to do this. Any problems here? Any, any concerns? Right? How can we make sure this works while uh, being secure and also protecting privacy? Um, the other thing maybe to think about when thinking of, about research in particular is um, not just privacy, but also security from, from hackers, for example, right? Like uh, ransomware attacks are a very nasty way of losing all your research data. Um, you click on a link and all of a sudden your hard drive gets encrypted and until you pay X amount of Bitcoin. Right, like that's that's not a fun experience, um, and and that's something you don't want to go through, and it's not something you want any of your research assistants to go through. So I think um, talking about protocols, having clear protocols for remote work as well as remote teaching and learning, is really helpful, and setting expectations. But like, what what are our expectations to towards towards ourselves and towards our data, towards our subjects, um, study subjects, or I prefer the term study participants. Um, as well as towards our students and, and really understanding also their concerns and needs and then catering towards that. Uh, there's this whole like we're in this together, but I think it really applies. And um, uh, I, I, at least my experience so far is when you when you involve the people that are affected, which might be students or participants and so forth, and you ask about them what their concerns are, you might actually um, end up with a solution that's quite different from what you thought in, initially was necessary. Great. Well, thank you both so much for your time. Really enjoyed the conversation. Um, and we'll leave it at there.